joy it is to be here this morning. Um, and a great honor to be opening the Word of God before you this morning. If you would, please turn with me in your copy of the Word of God to Psalm 103. And if you're turning there, they always tell you in seminary never to begin your address with an apology, but I really do feel I need to um, realign your expectations. Last night you heard Jim say I was the best preacher on the land. You've got to realize something with Jim. He has the gift of, of speaking to the ugliest girl in the room and making her feel like a princess. So, <laughs> so thank you, Jim. I really appreciate you. Um, so let's pick up the reading. In verse 15. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. I want to speak to you today about the grand task of raising children as heirs of the covenant, what our fathers used to call helping them to improve their baptism. Now I once heard um, Ligon Duncan talking about interaction with his friend Mark Dever and, and he said Mark was asked to critique my um, views on baptism and he said two things. He said too soon and not enough water. Uh, and that's what many of our dear Baptist brothers think of Presbyterian household baptism. Actually, I think if we could just have not called it pedo-baptism and started off with the biblical term household baptism, we've been off to a runner. Because people say there's no evidence of a child being baptized in uh, the Bible. I would dispute that, of course, but... Uh, I would say there's very little evidence of households being baptized in our average Baptist church. So if you're here this morning and you are a Baptist brother, you believe, you believe in believer's baptism, so do I. I also believe in believer's baptism. I just believe we baptize the household with the believer, as we'll see later on. But if you're here from a Baptist background, we welcome you. I'm glad you're here, and I hope there's much for you to glean as well. I used to be a Reformed Baptist before I became a Reformed Presbyterian, and many of my best friends are Reformed Baptists, and I thank God for them, and I'm always greatly encouraged by the time I get to spend with them over the Word. There's much more that unites us than divides us, but just a little water. That's exactly what baptism is not. Baptism in a Presbyterian covenantal perspective um, represents a whole world and life view with en enormous implications for the household and the family. And I want to walk through those with you this morning a little bit as we uh, make our way through various scriptures. Now, I've pastored Presbyterian churches for the best part of 25 years in America, and I have to say there's tremendous confusion in the church today about the status of covenant children. Um, what precisely is their relationship with God? Do we treat them as believers or unbelievers? Do we require them to be converted? Uh, do we encourage them to think of themselves growing up as unconverted until they show evidence of being converted? Um, do, do we regard them as members of the church? Do we speak about them when they come to profess their faith and come to the Lord's table as we do in a Presbyterian church? Do, do, do we describe that moment as Presbyterians almost invariably do as their child joining the church, right? Um, uh, how do we view our children, right? And that's a problem. And it's a problem because we're confused about the child's status. And that confusion exists on both sides of the ecclesiastical divide. It, 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 it's it's an, our Baptist brothers too. Uh, have confusion. How do we deal with a, a tender child in those tender years when they grow up? And that's, that's part of, I think, where the confusion comes from, because a child's psychology develops, just like Christ. Those amazing words in Luke's Gospel, where Luke says he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's amazing that Christ, the son of the everlasting God, would grow in wisdom. He was never foolish, of course, but he was... Less wise when he was young, and he was more wise when he was older. 
His mind grew. His capacity to think through issues and give a wise answer developed with age. He grew in wisdom and in stature. He grew physically. No surprises there. He was a little baby. And then he became a big man. And then, um, and in favor that God, God himself, his favor for his incarnate son grew. I would never, I would never have dared say that. But Luke says it. Therefore, God says it. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Not so much that God, he, was, he was never out of favor with the Father, of course. But as Christ's capacity to obey, to sacrifice, grew, his Father's pride in him grew and expanded. Like maybe uh, a father looking at his son's athletic ability maturing and growing. And as we see him grow and mature and develop, our pride for him increases and expands, right? And likewise with God, as Jesus hurt, cleared every hurdle God set before him, God's pride grew because those hurdles grew as Christ's capacity for obedience and sacrifice grew until that last climactic moment when Christ obeyed to the point of death and then Paul has to steady himself to say, even death on a cross. The Jews refused to speak about the cross. It was an unspeakably horrid way to die. You were not high in the air. You were only a few feet off the ground. You were naked. There was no loincloth to cover the shame. And you were exposed to the eyes of everyone walking by. It was the climactic act of Christ's obedience. And the father's favor for his son grew as his son's capacity to sacrifice and obey increased through his life. And so... We face that with our children, don't we? Our children have a developing psychology. You take a three or, three or four-year-old child, and they are innately credulous, right? You tell them that a well-upholstered elderly gentleman travels the earth with magic reindeer in the middle of December, <laughs> delivering president, presents to every man, woman, boy, and girl on the planet. Now, the algorithm certainly seems to favor wealthier children. They always do better on the present side of the um, agenda. Why doesn't he solve world hunger and bring like at least like DoorDash Happy Meals to the children in Africa? You know, it's kind of bizarre. Um, but children don't worry about that. You tell them that, right? And they don't go, oh, you know, wait a second, Dad. He's, how did he get down the chimney? It's like, it's, it's tiny space. <laughs> and where are the marks in the roof after he landed? He damaged the shingles. Dad, you're a science denier. They don't do that. You tell a three or four year old this story, and they say, "Pass me a pen and paper." <laughs> do you know what the dress? I want to make a list, <laughs> right? More presents. You take the same child ten years later on. Um, the hormone fairies arrive. They're going through puberty, and shall we say they're a little bit more skeptical about the wisdom of mum and dad. You know, I picked up Ben recently from the airport. He came back from Go City, and Ben's just, I'm so proud of him, he's doing so well. But he came in, of course, and we were downstairs at the arrival terminal, um, and Ben comes downstairs, and he couldn't find us. And eventually he comes outside, and he goes, Dad, you should have been upstairs. And I said, No, Dad, no, son, that's the departure area. No, son, that, 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 that's where all my friends, parents met them on the gangway thing. They were all upstairs. You came to the wrong terminal. I said, Ben. What did I do? Mean, I could start trying to say, Look at the sign, son. Look, it's up. But I, I, you know, teenagers have this innate instinct toward confirmation bias. The harder you try, try to, uh, to persuade them of something, um, they just, you know, no, besides when I just answered in the universal teenage language and said, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and we drove home and had a, a, a wonderful, wonderful time. It's why they say God gives you grandchildren his kind reward for not murdering your own. <laughs> um, but you see the same dynamic spiritually, don't you, to some extent. The three or four year old child who loves nothing better than singing Hide Him In My Heart CDs on endless repeat on the way home from Walmart. Give them 10 years and you have the devil of a job getting them to open their hymn book, much less sing in corporate worship. What gives? How do we explain that? That dynamic. Now, if you're from our, if you're from the typical American Baptist church, right, that's Arminian in conviction, there's no problem. Of course, the young child 
does believe in Jesus, they are truly saved, and then as they grow older, they maybe fall away from Jesus, they backslide, and their whole conversion experience is called into question, and they're told, you know, they need to be converted again or come back to Jesus. Take that out to a Reformed Baptist church, and they've got, uh, how do they explain a child, a, the, the child in those early developing years and their seeming love for Jesus, uh, and then what we see in many covenant children when they, when they get to those teenage years and they start pushing back and, and resisting mom and dad's instruction. How do they explain that? It's much more difficult to actually... They, and what they tend to do is they tend to have a pretty skeptical vision of the child in those early years. It's kind of like, we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see if you're really converted son. Now, they don't say that, of course, but they think that. And the child invariably hears that. And I've seen it time and time again. Many of my dear Reformed Baptist brothers, their children grew up insecure. Um, am I really saved? And, they, and they're expecting a dramatic conversion experience. And what do you do with the child who grows up on their testimony, which is the way I pray for all of my children, that they will never know a day when they didn't love Jesus. And you've got these children who grew up in like, well, what, position A in the Covenant Church, and they get to teenage years, and they've always loved reading their Bible, they've always loved praying, they've always loved worshiping God, but they, haven't had, they, haven't had, they don't have this dramatic falling away and conversion experience, and so what are they to do? And I've seen them going through endless rounds, struggling to find an assurance of God's love. How do we help them navigate that. Now, in our Presbyterian churches, there's a movement, the Federal Vision Movement, which goes to the other extreme. If you have the Baptists on that side, on the far side of our Presbyterian churches, you have a Federal Vision group, and they tend to um, be overly presumptive. It's almost a Roman Catholic vision of the family, that children are full members of the covenant of grace. They are saved. We treat them as saved that there's no distinction between the external sign of baptism and the inward reality of baptism. You know what Paul said about circumcision? Um, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart by the Spirit whose praise is not from men but from God. There's a distinction between external circumcision and the internal reality. And our brothers in the Federal Vision, they, they don't see that distinction in baptism. If a child is baptized, that baptism is a seal of that child's regeneration, right? And the child is to be treated as a, as a, as a believer and is to be assured of salvation all the way through their life and is to be taken to the table at a very young age and so forth and so on. And I think that's very dangerous because it's, it's undermining a number of key doctrines. We must be born again. Jesus said that. And he said that to Nicodemus. One of the teachers in, in Israel. It's amazing how much religion you can have, how much knowledge you can have. As Packer said, you can know an awful lot about God and know nothing of God, right? And so it's amazing how much you can have and not have Christ. And we need to help our children think through, have they been born again? It's not enough for them to be, to be religious. Have they been born again? Have they put their trust in Christ? They're not trusting their religion, not trusting their faith or their conversion experience. They're trusting in Jesus, right? And our Federal Vision brothers, I think, tend to undermine those very significant doctrines. So what do we mean? You heard me say there a minute ago, so are our children members of the covenant of grace. We call them covenant children. Let's work through that together. Now, you understand, um, 10, 15, if I finish at 5 past 10 or 10, 15, Paul, Paul here, is he gone? He's gone. I keep on going then, until he comes back. <laughs> um, whenever you start to leave, I'll gradually grind to a halt. Um, um, so, you understand the Bible is fundamentally a tale of two covenants, right? You've got the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, right? The covenant of works describes Adam's relationship with God and all men descending from Adam by ordinary generation. And we say ordinary generation to protect Christ, right? Because Christ did not descend from Adam 
by ordinary generation. Christ is saying that as a fresh start, a new beginning, by the extraordinary work of God the Holy Spirit on an ovum in, in Mary's womb, right? And he gets half of his DNA from Mary, and he gets the other half from the Holy Spirit, but he gets none of his person from Adam. His person descends from God himself and therefore is free from Adam's fall. But every human being descending from Adam by ordinary generation is born into this world as a dead soul in a dying body because of Adam's sin. Right. So the covenant of works was made between God, Adam, and every human being descending from Adam by ordinary generation. And when Adam sinned, as the New England Primer says, in Adam's fall, sinned we all, right? The famous alphabetical New England Primer. All of us have sinned. And that dooms mankind. If there was no Christ, no second Adam, there'd be no hope for any of us at all, right? And so, Adam, the covenant of grace. Now, the covenant of grace does not begin in Matthew's Gospel. When does the covenant of grace begin? Genesis 3.15. In God's word to the serpent. That I will, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. He shall crush you in the head. And you shall bruise or crush him on the heel. He will pay a very great price undoing what Adam has done and what you did, Satan. But you'll pay the greater price. You'll be crushed on the head. He'll only be crushed on the heel. And that covenant of grace that began there, who are the members of the covenant of grace? Well, the members of the covenant of grace are, the covenant of grace is made between God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, but God the Father, and Christ, and all the elect, in him. Right? Do you remember our catechism? Amazing how, how many problems the catechism solves. Um, God having out of his mere good pleasure, what's the next word? Elected some to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant to deliver them out of the state of sin and misery, and to bring them into an, a state of salvation by a redeemer. Right? So the covenant of grace is made between God the Father, God the Son, and all of the elect in him. And that's really important because Christ is the guarantor of that salvation, of that covenant. If any members of that covenant are lost, Christ has failed in his mission. You remember how Jesus says... Um, in John uh, 6, and I've gone ahead on my notes here to see if I can find it here. Let's just turn me in the Bible. Turn in John 6 a second um, with me in your Bible if you have a copy of John 6. Yeah, John six thirty seven. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Right? And it's that covenant that Paul describes in Romans 5. Turn there a second with me. This famous passage in the two Adams, Romans 5.12. Now, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sin. Right? Then there's a dash. And that dash means that Paul suffered from ADHD, like me. He goes off on this kind of like um, rabbit trail, just for a second, he comes back again. But Paul's making a commitment. He said, just as, just as through one man death entered the world and death through sin because all sinned. All sinned in Adam. 
right? And what he's going to say is, in exactly the same way, life comes through Christ, because Christ did not sin, right? And he gets back to his point later on. And so he says in verse 19, For as through one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Right? The many will be made righteous. So you've got, you've got um, Christ, you've got Adam, the many, all descending from him. And Paul says many because he's, he's saying all, coming from Adam essentially, are made sinners. And then he uses the word many because not everybody's in Christ. Those that God puts from, Christ, from Adam into Christ are made righteous. In other words, the same logic that dooms the world in Adam, excuse me, redeems the world in Christ. It's exactly the same logic. It works the same way. It's the same operating system. Right? Now, an illustration of that. You may have heard of Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan. He, he had the illustration of his two giants, right? And he, his point is, there really, really are two men who matter in the world. The first is um, Adam and the second is Christ. The picture in your mind's eye these two giants, and they've got this every good self-respecting giant's got this huge, big, thick leather belt with a brass buckle, and on that leather belt there are hooks, and on those hooks there are human beings. On Adam's belt, um, the uh, the hooks are full of every human being who ever lived. And when Adam fell, all the people on the hooks fell with him. Right now, God in His mercy takes some people off Adam's belt and puts them on Christ's belt. And God, Paul says, decided to do that before the foundation of the world. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, that's um, 1 Peter, sorry. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That God decided to take some men off Adam's belt and put them onto Christ's belt. And if you're in Christ this morning, en Christo, it's a glorious thing, God has never, there's never been a moment in God's eternal existence when he looked at you or thought of you without also thinking of his lovely son, Jesus Christ. He always looks at you through Christ's colored spectacles. It's a beautiful thought. And so you have these two giants. And of course, Adam, Christ did not fall, but he stood. And all the ones on his belt stand with him. It's a covenant of grace. Now, the question then becomes, okay, if the covenant of grace is only between God the Father, God the Son, and the elect, in what sense can we speak of our children as members of that covenant? I have totally left my notes. I'll just have to drop them to one side. So um, the key word is administration. Administration. That covenant of grace, like a tornado, touches down in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it's administered in in the midst of a visible people. In the Old Testament, that visible people is who? The Jews, Israel. In the New Testament, that visible people is who? The church, the new Israel. The church is not Israel disbanded. The church is Israel expanded. Peter and Paul speak of the church in Israeli terms all the time. We are a living temple. We're people of God's own possession. Um, um, 1 Peter 2, full of language. It's very Israeli about the church. Right? And in both the Old Testament and the New Testament... That covenant community is made up of building blocks, and those building blocks are families. I want you to, want you to see that with me a second here. Um, look, at, um, look at Noah. I, actually, even before that, it's amazing, you know, God gives this promise to Adam to put enmity between the seeds. And the next thing Adam does is he names his wife Eve, right? And it's a beautiful thing. 
to name something in the Old Testament is to define its identity. God named things, the sea, the dry land, the sky, and so forth. And he calls Adam to name the animals, his leadership. And God, Adam names Eve before the fall, he calls her woman. But he also names Eve after the fall, he calls her Eve. And he's re-establishing his headship, right, in the family. Um, and lots of people, one of, uh, one of uh, um, Jim's granddaughters is called Eve. And people used to rebuke Becca, his daughter, for calling her. How could you call your daughter Eve? She brought sin into the world. And uh, to Tara, and I said, uh, I remember one of the first chats I had with Becca about this. I said to her, no. I said, actually, it's a beautiful thing because when Adam called his, his wife's name Eve, it was one of the greatest acts of faith the world's ever seen. Because God just told him, from death you have come, and from to death you shall return. And he gave his wife's name the name of life. Why? Because she'd be the mother of all the living. Adam is not just saying that she is the mother of not all her kids will die in miscarriage. What Adam is saying is death will not have the last word over all of your children. And the reason for that is because from your womb will come more than death. From your womb, somehow, at some time, I can't explain, one will come forth whose name will be life. In him will be life, and life will be the light of man. Right? One of the greatest acts of faith, as Adam reaches through the threat of judgment and lays hold of the promise of life. Right? So, just before Genesis 3.15, Adam's in a dark, dark room, pitch black. And God turns the light on outside in the hall, and a shiver of, sliver of light, just like C.S. Lewis's tool shed, comes under the door. That's Genesis 3.15, right? Now, the rest of the Old Testament, God gradually opens the door more and more and more, letting more light in to the room. Until Christ comes, and the new heavens and the new earth, or the, the sun, the, the, the Christ rises as the sun of righteousness, with healing upon his wings, and there's light now flooding the room from the outside. Now, in the Old Testament, right, as God makes his way through from Genesis 3.15 to Malachi, he gradually builds on and expands the covenant of grace. It's a bit like Jim's homestead. Jim's homestead is a magical place. But it's much bigger now than it used to be. He's always adding little bits onto it, little nooks and crannies. It's it's like the professor's house in Narnia, just always these these little corridors, and it's just wonderful. But he's always adding bits onto it. And God, as you go through the Old Testament, is, is, is developing and expanding on the idea of this covenant of grace. He does it in sections. So he begins with Noah, which essentially buys him time not to legally wipe out mankind every generation. right? And the, the covenant of Noah is a covenant as part of the covenant of grace. right? Now what does God say to Noah? Well, we're told, if you turn with me in Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Full stop. Right? Now, that's, that's, that's important to realize, that Noah is part of those men. Noah is part of the, of the great herd of mankind about whom God said every intent of the thought of their heart was only evil continually. And that Noah was the same as that, but he was different, because Noah found grace. Now, the Hebrew rightly translates Noah found grace, but the meaning is grace found Noah. And that's why Noah becomes righteous. It wasn't that Noah was righteous and then God gave him grace. No, grace laid hold of him and made him different. And the Hebrew text is very, very clear about that. Now, fast forward to Genesis 7, verse 1. God comes to wipe out the world, and what does God say? Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you, and the Hebrew is singular, you alone, I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. And yet, who's gathered onto the ark? No one is family. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we know Ham is reprobate. But God doesn't treat Ham as reprobate until Ham becomes reprobate. 
And until that moment comes, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are all gathered under the ark and for a time are sheltered under the ark, which is a picture of the gospel. They're preserved temporarily, right? That covenant that with, with the elect is administered in a way that brings massive blessing to Ham's life. More about that in a second. Fast forward to the next kind of add-on to the covenantal homestead when Abraham comes along in Genesis 17. Now, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham or Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And then go to verse 6. I have made you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you make nations of you. Kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Now, that sign of circumcision, God so identifies with the covenant that he actually calls it the covenant. This is my covenant. And God has Abraham apply that to all his sons. Now, later in the New Testament, my Baptist friends will say, baptism is always associated with faith. Repent, believe, and be baptized. I say, I'll grant you that. But so is circumcision. So what's circumcision? Look in, look in Romans 4 a second. Verse 11. And Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. But circumcision is also a sign of faith. Abraham's justifying faith, yet God has him apply that sign to children who have yet to believe. Ishmael, the first circumcised young lad, wasn't a believer. Next generation, Jacob and Esau. Esau's not a believer. Never would be. But God applies the sign of faith to all these children. That is a significant thing. The household character of the covenant continues in the next addition to the homestead covenant, if you excuse the the metaphor, um, in on Passover night. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. On the Passover night, they sacrifice the Passover lamb. What's the procedure? Well, the father stands up and says, Shlomo, do you believe in the Passover lamb? Yes, Daddy. Okay. okay. Ruth, do you believe in the Passover lamb? No, Daddy. Outside. <laughs> Is that what happened? No. He applied the blood of the Passover lamb to what? The doorpost of the household. And the very picture of the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to the household. That's not guaranteeing um, the salvation of everybody in that household eternally. But it is saying something. It's surely not saying nothing about the children nestling under that covenantal blessing. More about that in uh, a second. Right? Then you fast forward um, to... Then you you, you fast forward to um, the Psalms. And you see David saying things like we said earlier on, as for man, his days are like grass, the flower of the field so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And those who remember his covenant, those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant, and remember his precepts to do them. We still sing that song today in the church. Or Psalm 128. 
How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you shall eat the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. Now, is he just saying your wife will have lots of children? But vine is a picture of spiritual life in the Old Testament. Christ is the true vine. Within your house, your children will be like olive plants. The very plant that they took the oil from which they they symbolized the Holy Spirit anointing the prophets, priests, and kings. The very oil from the olive plant. Your children will be like olive plants. I don't think he's just speaking about them being healthy and not getting COVID. I I think he's severely. (laughs) um, Whether they're vaccinated or not. But I I think, sorry, back. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Um, I think he's making a statement about spiritual life flowing down through a family that when a man fears the Lord, his wife will be more of a grape than a raven. It's always a sign for me. It's always a, it's, it's always a, a concerning sign to see a woman withering under a fa- under husband's headship. She should be. She should be healthy in her soul and thriving. We saw last night, a beautiful picture last night of the redeeming power of Christ in a husband and a wife. Something for us all to um, reach for. So at every level, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, there's this sense of the household character. What about when the New Old Testament stands on its tippy toes and kind of looks forward to the New Covenant, right? Well, our Reformed Baptist brothers will say, look at Jeremiah 31, and I would say amen, right? Now, I can't spell Jeremiah. Um, Verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now, our Reformed Baptist brethren say, Look, the New Testament church is made up of people who know God, right? It's different. In the Old Testament, there was a division. New Testament, that division is gone. The, 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 the true church are only made up of believers. If that's true, when Christ goes to um, Smyrna, why does he say to Smyrna, not Smyrna, Sardis, you have a name to live, but you're dead. He doesn't say you're a synagogue of Satan. You have a name to be a church, but you're not. He calls them a church, though they're dead. We'll more about that in a second. Now, there's another way of interpreting this. As you move from the New Testament, Old Testament to the New, everything is bigger, better, and brighter. There will no longer be a lay people distinction. You'll know the prophets, the priests, and the kings had a closer experience of God than the plebs, the minions had. And if they wanted to know about God, they had to go to the priests and to the prophets. And you remember whenever Moses was prophesying, uh, or somebody prophesied in the camp and they came and said, so and so is prophesying. And Moses says, would to God that all of God's people were prophets. Well, Jeremiah is saying that day will be the New Testament. Read the day of Pentecost. They will dream dreams and, and see visions. Not that we do dream dreams and see visions, but Joel is saying that in, when the Spirit comes, and he's saying, I'm finding it hard to find a metaphor to you. So I'm going to say to you like this, you're going to have the same kind of connection to God and his word that only people like me had in the Old Testament. Right? Now, maybe you're not convinced. Look at the next chapter, Jeremiah 32. Do we lose the familial aspect of the, in the New Covenant? Verse 37. 
Behold, I will gather, gather them. And he's speaking here of the new Israel. The, the, the prophets, the apostles speak of these promises being fulfilled in the church. I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath, and in my great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me also, always, for their own good and for the good of their children after them. That's undeniably a New Testament promise. And it, it, it trickles down through the generations. Or Ezekiel 37. We need to pick up our speed a little bit. Ezekiel 37, right? Verse 24. After the Valley of Dry Bones, God prophesies, My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I give to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. That's the new heavens and the new earth, ultimately. But it's they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, who is Jesus, my servant, will be their prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will make, place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever still embraces children. And none of that should surprise us, of course, because the reason God deals with people in households is, is, is wedded to the very warp and woof of God's own being. Know, therefore, that the Lord, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations. That's just not how God likes to act. No, that's the way God is at the very core of his being. And the household nature of the covenant can only change if God himself changes, and that can never happen. So it's no surprise then when you step into the New Testament and you see Jesus blessing children. He's not just going, oh, bless their heart, right? These are Jews, Jewish children, and he's blessing them. Aaron, lift up your hand and bless my people. The Lord bless you and keep you. God could never bless. Jesus would never bless like that a a child outside the covenant community. Or when when the wee little man, Zacchaeus, is converted, what does Christ say? Today, salvation has come to this man? No, to this house. And then Pentecost... Jesus, uh, the the disciples say, the promise is to you and to your children. Now remember, we're stepping into the New Testament. Everything's bigger, better, and brighter. Imagine Shlomo and his son, um, Samson, walking away from Pentecost. And his dad saying, this is great. Everything's bigger, better, and brighter. More of the Spirit. More of the Word. More of God. We get to come into the Holy of Holies every day. It's, It's better. And the wee lad says, Dad, it's better for you, but not for me. If the Baptists are right, I just got excommunicated. No, it's bigger and better and brighter for everybody in the covenant community. And so Paul's amazing words in, when he comes in, in 1 Corinthians 7. Verse 12. But to the rest I say, not to the... Not the Lord, I say, and he's he's saying, I'm saying this as an apostle, I'm not quoting Jesus here in his earthly ministry, that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Why? For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her unbelieving husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but neither holy. That's incredible. They're set apart, they're sanctified, they're set apart as special. The unbelieving wife, the unbelieving husband, while she is unbelieving, while he is unbelieving, is sanctified through the faith. Brought from outside the camp to inside the camp where the holy things are. They're part of the covenant community. And so it's no surprise then when you see the apostles meet people like the Philippian jailer he said, what shall I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and you'll be saved, you and your household. Now, why did Paul say that? Is that like a, a word of direct verbal prophecy? Mm, channeling the Holy Spirit here. Your whole household are going to be saved. It's unusual. It's not going to happen later on. But, but now, it's, no. How can we explain those words? Because of the whole household nature of the very character of salvation. Now, we'll get to the business end. So you heard me say at the start, right, that the covenant of grace is made between God, Christ, and the elect in him. In what sense are our children connected to that covenant? Well, God administers that covenant of election in the midst of a visible people. And he includes our children in that visible community. And that, commun- that community is always just one extent divided. There, there's, there's the real invisible church in that community, and then there's the, the external church. The, 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 there's, the, there's the visible church around it, those who are just part of the community, but they're not yet trusting right, in Christ for their salvation. And God, in his, in, his, in his wondrous prerogative, speaks about the whole community as if they are all of his elect. He speaks to the whole community as if they're his people. And yet there's also that tension between those who truly know Christ and those who as yet don't know him. How do we define that? What, 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 what do we say? Because when we baptize a child, and this is where I began to really think this through, what are we saying about this child when we baptize Huge thing. We don't, want to over, we don't want to say too much, and we certainly don't want to say too little. And what I want you to see is that what we're saying about this child is that they're born into a position of massive privilege, promise, and responsibility. And we need to help our children understand that. So they understand how they relate to God and his covenants. What do, we, what do I mean by privilege? Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 9 in a second. Paul here, Romans 9 comes after Romans 8. In Romans 8, Paul just said, no, nothing and no one can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, right? You're stuck with Christ. Once you're in Christ, you're stuck. And the Jews in Rome are saying, what about Auntie Ruth and Naomi and, you know, Uncle Abraham? They, they didn't believe in Jesus and they've been cut off. They've been separated from God's love. And so Paul begins a whole section, Romans 9, 10, and 11, to explain how some of the Jews were lost and God didn't break his promise. But notice, I'd love to walk through that with you, but there's no time now. But look at Romans 9, 1 to 5. Paul is is talking about these people. I'm telling the truth in Christ, not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are Israel. These are Jews who are Paul's brothers only according to the flesh, still part of the covenant community in a sense, but they're, 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 they're estranged from Christ. What does Paul say to them? They're Israelites. To whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory of and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, who are the fathers, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all blessed forever. Paul here is unpacking the real privilege the Jews enjoy. What Paul says about these Jews, we can say about all of our children. To them belong the adoption of sons, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, and the temple services, and the promises. They belong to them. And Paul here is unpacking the massive legal privileges our children enjoy as part of the church. Legal privileges. God looks at them and calls them mine. You are mine, and you'll always be mine. Even if you don't believe in me. We'll talk about that later. In a second. You're mine. You belong to me legally. The illustration I use is, imagine for a second, I owned a classic car collection. And some piece of land in North Carolina, and there on that land there's a large barn, and in that barn there are all these classic cars. Mustangs from the 60s, and a Dax Cobra, and all these old classic cars. 
When I come to die, I leave those cars to my children. Those cars are legally my children. Let's say my son doesn't like cars. He never goes to that barn, never opens the old doors, walks into the, the box on the side of the wall, opens the box, pulls out the keys to the Dax Cooper, walks across, unlocks it, sits in the seats, puts the key into the ignition, and turns it, and hears that this enormous engine roar into life. Never feels the thrill. Doesn't care about it. Walks away from it. The car belongs to him. He never makes use of it. And our children, the covenants, Christ, the gospel, all of the promises, God himself, belong to our children by their legal right. They're born, I say, with the adoption papers on their laps. And God's saying, son, sign this. In fact, God so wants them to sign it, he calls them, you're my son, before they even do sign it. Legal privileges. Like it's even better than that. Our children also have experiential privileges. Turn with me in, in Hebrews 6, verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him again and put him to open shame. Amazing statement. Now, Paul here is describing the the spiritual experience of a member of the church who falls away. What does he say about them? Enlightened. The taste of the heavenly gift. They've made, been made partakers. Of the, they've, like Saul experienced the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Our children experienced the Holy Spirit. And they taste of the word of God and the power to these to come. There was an atheist converted in our church. Actually, he was a, a lapsed covenant child, an atheist. And um, I saw the new birth fall down out of heaven upon him one day. I mean, it, it was really, not, not literally, but almost literally. It's a, a, a new time to tell you a story. It's just an amazing story, though. Another time, maybe during the question time. It's really a good story. But later, right, I asked him. He was, he was a rampant atheist. I saw him born again in an instant. He literally went from being a hostile skeptic. One minute. I said to him, you must be born again. And he literally jumped. Like this. He lurched. And he said to me, I quote, I want to spend the rest of my life glorifying God. How do I do that? I thought, I have never heard that happen before. Like I said, you must be born again. And he literally jumped and he said, I want to spend the rest of my life glorifying God. That's never happened to me before. Never. I mean, it's amazing. Anyway, but... So later on, I was speaking to him. I said, How did, walk me through your spiritual... How did you come back to Christ? And he said, well, it was a long time, actually, because my dad was an angry man, member of the church, but an angry, bitter man. And he came to, to Kirk of the Isles, and he changed. He became a sweet, meek, gracious man. And my atheism gave me no categories to explain what happened to my dad. So then he said, I came. Christmas and Easter, Father's Day, Mother's Day, I came. Keep mum and dad happy. But he said, when I got into that church and sat down in worship, he said, I couldn't deny there was a spiritual power at work in your assembly that my atheism gave me absolutely no categories to explain. The powers of the age to come. Our children grew up legal, legally privileged. All these things belong to them and experientially privileged. They're in the church and they feel the wind of the Spirit blowing through. And I know they can feel it. Even if they're not born again, they can feel it. Something's happening here. Massive. Privilege. Legal privilege. Experiential privilege. Also promise. All of the promises of the gospel belong to them. Isaiah 55, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. 
Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good. And delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And you can see a covenant child thinking, there's no way God will have mercy on me after all I've done. I've rejected him, I've despised him, I've resisted him. No way, no hope for me. He will abundantly pardon. And then God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. You see that on the kind of the Milky Way picture, you know, my thoughts not your thoughts. God isn't describing the bigness of his mind. He's speak, describing the bigness of his heart. I will abundantly pardon. I can't believe God would have those, those kinds of thoughts toward me. And Paul says, but my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your way. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so much greater are my thoughts of mercy than your thoughts of mercy. My capacity to forgive than your capacity to forgive. And so forth and so on. Privilege, promise, all these promises, and responsibility. Our children are responsible. God has a right, after all of this privilege and promise, God has a right to expect their allegiance and trust. And the Bible clearly says that, he, that, that if they turn away from God after all he has done, they can expect the swiftest and most severe judgment. Remember um, Hebrews 10, 28. Now listen to the last words of this. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and is regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? The blood of the covenant sanctified them, which is exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. The unbelieving spouse is sanctified. They're sanctified by the blood of the covenant. Even if they're not fully saved in that covenant yet by faith, they're still sanctified. And has insulted the spirit of grace, for we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge those who thought they were his people but were not. No, The Lord will judge his people. The Puritans would say that the bottom of hell is carpeted with the souls of covenant children. They're they're, they're still God's people there. The Lord will judge his people. That's huge. And we need to help. We don't want to frighten our children to heaven, right? But we need to help our children feel the weight of this. And so often, Presbyterians are confused. We don't want to say too much. Are our children elect? Is baptism really a seal of their regeneration? What do we, what's it mean? I don't, I don't know. And so they're kind of confused, and the children are confused then too. If there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew, the old saying. And if parents are confused, right, what hope do the children have? We need to t- bring, bring our children up to feel the weight of these things. That when we baptize, so what's that mean? I have 10, 12 minutes left. There's a, there's a whole host of things I'd love to say. Um, but it would have been meaningless if I hadn't said all this first, so <laughs> bear with me. First thing, we've got to help our children feel the weight of what it means to be baptized. It's a lot more than a little water, right? When I baptized my children, my congregation have heard this a thousand times. This water is a symbol. And it's, obviously, the baby. Um, is a tender years, but I, t- I talk to their siblings who have been baptized. And I say, this, we applied this water to your head, and this means, son, daughter, that you belong to God, and you always will. God has marked you out as mine. Mine. And this water is a symbol. It reaches back. The symbol of water we pour out or sprinkle is a, is a symbol of three waters in the Bible, First of all, the water of God's judgment. Peter in 1 Peter talks about, he likens the water of baptism corresponds to the water of the flood. Right? 
And we're saying, this child deserves the judgment of Almighty God. And unless they find someone to stand in their place and receive that judgment, they're going to feel that judgment forever. Right? And you deserve the judgment of God. Right? But Jesus was baptized for you. I never tire of reading this quote. Bear with me a second. Well, I'll find it here. Um, Jeff Thomas, a dear Reformed Baptist brother. Trust you'll forgive me for using this, this quote. Um, but Christ's baptism. There is a great line of repentant sinners standing soberly and sorrowing on the bank of the Jordan, waiting to go down into the waters to join John to be baptized. Survey them there in your mind with me, standing in that long, guilty line of sinners. There's a thief, a drunkard, an adulterer, a liar, a bully, a wife beater, an idol worshipper, a torturer, Jesus, a murderer, a forger, a troublemaker, a braggart, a terrorist, a blasphemer, an abuser of children, a spendthrift, and hundreds more, every one a sinner. And there is Jesus, made in the likeness of sinful flesh, standing in line between the torturer and the murderer, indistinguishable outwardly, but inwardly he is holy without sin. As the prophet Messiah said, as the prophet said, Messiah would be numbered with the transgressors. He stands with sinners in solidarity, he stands for sinners in substitution. He will hang on a tree as the Lamb of God and bear the sins of the world. And at the last, he will do more than stand with us in our sins. He will be made sin for us. That is why he stands here today in the sinner's baptism, because one day he will climb Golgotha in love and stand in the closest possible contact with sinners, taking responsibility for their sin and answering for it before the throne of God. Like two drops of water glistening on the the hood of that Dax Cobra and they touch one another and they coalesce and the one becomes indistinguishable from the other. When Christ took us into union with himself, that happened not just with us body and soul but with our spiritual record to become one. All of our sins become legally his as much as my wife's credit card spending today becomes legally mine. Our sins become legally Christ's. When Christ sang the Psalms, my sins are more numbered than the hairs of my head, he didn't stop singing in those moments. He sang those songs with you and in you in the same way as you can sing, answer me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. And Christ puts his arm around us and says, it's okay, brother, I've got that part for you. He gets our sins, we get his righteousness. And we have, we're baptizing our kids, you deserve God's judgment, but Christ was baptized for you and in you in the Jordan and on the cross. Then the waters of God's cleansing, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and and you'll be clean. God promises, Ezekiel 36, 25, I will cleanse you, wash you, purify you, and so forth and so on, right? The waters of God's cleansing. The child is dirty and needs to be cleansed. And then the waters of God's spirit, baptism of water, Baptism of the Spirit, spoken of almost synonymously, the one points to the other, right? And what God is promising, because that's, that's one of the struggles, right? Baptist parents, I remember when I was a Baptist, um, I would be praying with my kids, and I sort of, can they pray that God would give them the Holy Spirit? But if they're not converted, uh, uh, um, they can't have, and you get caught, right, is the child converted, right? Which is entirely the wrong axle to get bent around. It's not unimportant, right? Not unimportant. I don't know if my kids are converted. I don't know if you're converted. There are some days I wonder, am I converted? Right. But, um, but what I do know is my children are in covenant with God and God has made these promises to them and God is promising things. saying, son, daughter, there will be days in your life when you are weak and you have no strength. You can't go, you, you'll feel overwhelmed by titanic temptation that you can't say no to. And you will need help. And that day, I'm promising you the Holy Spirit. Call upon me, and I will deliver you, and you'll glorify me. I'll give you my spirit. You're not standing against sin by yourself. So we teach our children from their earliest days, Lord, 
Give me the Holy Spirit. There's no strength without it, no hope without it, no Christ without it. It's their birthright, and they should cry to God for it. And so baptism is more than a moment in our children's lives. It's a lifestyle, a way of thinking about God and their promise, privilege, and responsibility. We should encourage them to think about the reality of baptism. We should also encourage them to think about, as they make their way through life, right, that they can expect God to deal with them in a fatherly way. Who was the first covenant child? Cain, exactly. Quickly turn in Genesis 4 a second. We really are coming to an end here. Genesis 4. And this, this is profound to me. This is a profound to me. If God were a Baptist, forgive me if you're a Baptist here this morning, but if God were a Baptist, right, if God were a Baptist, God would come up to Cain and say, listen, Cain, you're unconverted. You're a lost son. You're dead in your sins. You're a slave of sin. There's no point even trying to worship. Let me explain to you. Total inability. Wait till Martin Luther writes to Erasmus in, uh, you know, 3,500 years' time. It'll become clear to you, right? But, you know, um, is that right? No, 6,500 years' time. Whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. I'll do the math later. But long time. <laughs> right. And really, there's no point in me even talking to you, son, because you're a child of wrath, and until you get saved, I can have no meaningful relationship with you. And that's often the way Baptists deal with their kids. That until you're saved, there, there's really no meaning. For God, you're a child of wrath. Until you're converted, I'm sorry. That's kind of the implication. Right? You've got to get saved. And then we can talk about trusting Christ and walking with God. But God approaches Cain and actually has a remarkably fatherly conversation with the lad. Cain attempts to worship God, and God rejects him. And his worship was rejected because Cain was rejected. God had no regard for Cain or for his worship. If the worshiper is wrong with God, the worship can never be right with God. Right? And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? That's interesting. Now God is not looking for information, as Jim said last night. When God asks a question, he's not looking for understanding from himself. He's looking for understanding for you. Cain, I know why you're angry. The question is, do you understand, son? Right? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to dominate you literally, but you must rule over it. That's amazing. God holds Cain. God isn't pretending. God, is, God isn't coming and saying, you know, we know he's not really elect and he's, he's not really reprobate, so I, I'm going to pretend. Okay. God isn't having a pretend conversation with this lad. God knows the guy's not elect, but God also knows the guy's in the covenant community privilege, promise, responsibility. And God has a real, sincere conversation with Cain. Just like Christ when he offers, he offers Judas the sop, which was a very intimate sign. It was a, you know, I don't know most of you, right? If we're having bread at Green Valley Grill and th there was a beautiful dipping sauce, I'm not going to take the bread and dip it and say, taste this. That's a bit weird. I don't know you, right? But I might do it with Jim. Jim, this is really good. Taste this, right? Because um, Jim's my friend, or Glenn, right? I, I know them well, right? Still a bit weird, but it wouldn't be totally weird, right? But, <laughs> but uh, Jesus, uh, the last sign that seals Judas's fate is a sign of friendship. And I think Christ is saying to Judas, it doesn't have to be this way, son. You can turn to me. Now, Jesus isn't denying reprobation. He is God. He's a real conversation. And we need to teach our children to expect God to have a fatherly conversation with them, to tug at their heart. Today, son, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart, Psalm 95. Yield yourself to that. Further, God says, come on, further in, further in, son, further in. Yield yourself to it. Give yourself to the Holy Spirit. And it's not unimportant. We need to help our children to think through, are they born again? Are they converted? If John can say to the church, if you say you know God, yeah, I know God, yes, but if you walk in the darkness, you lie and don't practice the truth. You can say to your child, son, I'm really concerned about you. 
you are walking in the darkness right now, and the Bible says if you walk in the darkness, at a certain point, I've got to ask the question, are you only darkness? Right? That's a perfectly just conversation. If you live according to the flesh, Paul says to the church, you will die. There's an inexorable logic there, John Murray says, even for the elect. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. God doesn't footnote. But if you're elect, you can ignore this. No. There's a reaping and sowing logic to life. We need to help our children think through all those things. There's no time. Time's up. But the big thing I want to say is we need to encourage our children to yield themselves to God. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to encourage our children to do that, surely it stands to reason that we must have done that ourselves first. That whatever else, and this is when I think, when I think, my swing thought when I was a Christian father, and the Lord knows I fail every single day. What do I want my children to remember of their father? I want them to remember a man who was happy in God. If, if we can't, if we can't present a joyful Christian life before them. I think it would almost be better for us not to be professed to be Christians at all. And so often, we allow the troubles of life and the problems and the burdens, and it, they rob us of our joy. And Jack and Miller's famous question, Jack was a great man, the father of the Sonship Movement, of course, and many of his disciples took things way too far, but Jack was a good man. And one of the questions Jack would always ask people, Where's your joy? Where's your joy? It's a very powerful diagnostic question because it shows whether or not we're truly walking with God by faith because when we walk with God by faith, even when in sunshine and in shadow, with Paul we can say, I have learned. It doesn't come easily. It doesn't come naturally, but I have learned in whatever state I am, therein to be content. Because I know Christ. And praise God, Christ is not ashamed to know me. He's forgiven all of my sins. He's taken me into covenant with himself. And you can only ever lose your joy if you first forget that. We need to remember that, and treasure that, and live that before our children. And so we aren't standing at the edge of the pool saying, son, jump in. <laughs> We're in the water ourselves saying, son, further in, deeper in and further up. Isn't that what it was? Sorry. Man, come on in, son. Water's lovely, and and that's the heart and soul of the baptized life. It's much more than a little water. It's a way of doing life with God and with your family in time for eternity. Mm-hmm.